Hello, well it's time for our regular look at the world of British manufacturing in factory talk. Now over the next couple of programmes we're focusing on companies that aren't traditional manufacturers but instead provide services which help business. And the battle to survive and grow is an ongoing one, of course, for all companies. That's never been more crucial than at the moment. So over these next two programmes, we're talking to people from organisations that can help your business do just that. Now, Sage, of course, is a multinational company providing software and business solutions to other companies to help them manage their finances. It's been going for some 35 years and has 3 million customers worldwide, with about a million of those being in the UK. Rob Sinfield is Vice President of Product at Sage. He joins me now. Rob, it's good to talk to you. I think most people know of Sage. I gave a bit of an introduction there. But tell us more about what you actually are and what you provide. So thank you for having me on the show today. So Sage are, well, they're actually the UK's oldest software company, um, originally headquartered in Newcastle. And Sage has been providing software solutions, mainly in the accounting and finance space for small to medium sized businesses in the UK for, as you say, nearly 35 years. Um, we also provide a number of different payroll and people management solutions for manufacturing and distribution companies and organizations as a whole across the UK. Uh, an interesting stat for you is that roughly 63% of the private sector is actually paid using Sage software. So it's two thirds. Now over that 35 years, the way companies run their accounts, manage their payrolls, must have changed beyond all recognition during that time. It has, and I think this is the one area that, that people don't realise, that there's a lot of complexity that, that is kind of around the whole payroll space, around finance and accounting. We think of it traditionally as debits and credits, and debit and credits haven't changed for for for, for years and years and years. But what we're starting to see is the introduction of things like MTD, making tax digital, not MTD this program, <laughs> but the making tax digital um, initiative from the UK government and the HMRC has really uh, put a focus on the importance of technology. Organizations now need to submit their taxes electronically. Um, so you, this is where software companies like Sage can really start to provide solutions that enable companies to focus on what they do best, which is manufacturing, distributing or or providing services. And we take care of the heavy lifting and, and manage the, the, the complex calculations and the submissions to the government. Does it matter what size a company is for their ability to, to benefit from using software such as the, this stuff that you provide? I don't think it does. Um, we as Sage traditionally focus in on the smaller to medium sized organizations. So um, anything from sole traders all the way up to, to fairly sizable PLCs that may have a turnover of, of close to a billion pounds a year. We tend to stay away from those very, very large organizations at the top tier just because of the complexity that comes along with that. And we also tend to stick in our area of domain expertise, which is really those smaller to medium sized organizations. And that's because we feel we have the right level of capabilities and knowledge to support those organizations efficiently. Uh, it's interesting. So let's talk a little bit about those people that are self-employed, the, the, the small businesses. How does it, how does, how do things work now with these businesses? Obviously, you, you mentioned MTD. Um, it, it, taxation is constantly changing. Do you help these sort of small business to, to keep on top of that? We do. So we have a number of different products in the market um, that cater for different ends of the spectrum in terms of is it a smaller organization? Is it a sole trader? Is it a, a slightly larger organization? And with those, we deliver different levels of, of capabilities. Um, so for the small organization, we'll do everything for them end to end uh, processing. Now, we've taken a slightly different approach to this in that we're building a lot of uh, technology services or business services that sit around our applications and and complement the capabilities within those applications. So one of the things that we've done is we built a, a cloud service. So for those of you who, who aren't familiar with technology, a cloud service is really a, a service that's hosted by ourselves that allows us to connect to the HMRC and do the tax filing. So we build it once and we're able to support multiple customers with that 
uh, that capability. What that does is it brings economies of scale and it helps us to provide software at, the, the, at an optimal price point for the customers that we're targeting. Do you think you're changing people's opinions on tax? Are you making it, I mean, something, it's, it's a tax, is, it isn't literally, but it's a bit of a four-letter word, isn't it? Do you think you're making people less frightened of, uh, of tax? I, I think I think making tax digital has, it, it, let's look at it from a government perspective, first of all. I, I think the governments have made specific moves to try and tighten up what happens with taxation. But making tax digital has also really helped to to simplify the tax the taxation process it's made it a lot clearer it's removed some of the some of the ambiguity that existed and what we've done at sage is really focus in on how do we make it as easy as possible for people to manage their submissions so our services that integrate with the hmrc mtd portals for example will give will tell you what's in your submission what needs to be corrected we allow uh, people to make adjustments to those in the right way. We track them through audit trails so that they know when they submit that to the uh, to the tax authorities, it's done in the best possible way that it can be done. So the information contained is extracted directly from the applications, pushed through to the government. And as long as people have been putting the right stuff into the system, their tax declaration should be right on the on the outside on the other end of the uh, of the the process. Let, let's focus in on manufacturers if we can. How's technology impacting on manufacturers? This is a really interesting topic, and it, it, it's one of my favourite topics to talk about because I think technology is going to have and has already started to have a massive impact on manufacturing. Manufacturing is traditionally seen as this very traditional sort of staid, stale uh, industry where things move very, very slowly. If we look at things like Industry 4.0, it's a huge technology transformation of these these uh, of this industry. It's not just about adopting robotics. It's about adopting new types of technologies that enable decision making, that enable improved planning that enable optimizations and and uh, the introduction of new types of processes across the organization. And technology has become that, that massive enabler for these organizations. I think most manufacturers, though, have a, a, a maybe not a mistrust of technology, but certainly a cautious approach towards technology. If you look at research published by some of the large research, uh, re research analysts, um, they tend to talk about manufacturers being laggards in terms of technology adoption, um, which I think is is sometimes misrepresentative because a lot of manufacturers just don't have the time to implement some of the technology because you're running shifts all the time, you're producing goods. It's very difficult to find the downtime to focus on the technology that you want to implement and then start to take advantage of the, the, that technology. Um, a really good example of technology that can help manufacturers is something as simple as uh, an MES solution, a manufacturing execution solution. The ability to be able to track in real time what's happening on your production floor, have that information go into a central system, and then that system proactively provides you with uh, insights into what's happening. Maybe there is a degradation in terms of throughput through a production line. Why is that? Is that because there's a blockage somewhere? Is that because uh, there's a challenge with the way the machine has been set up? Um, are you monitoring your OEE values, your operational e uh, equipment efficiency values? Those sorts of um, uh, data points and the types of insights that you can get through through using something as, as simple as an MES solution can translate into huge improvements in terms of throughput as well as reductions in carbon footprints, uh, quality mm. recalls that you may have because you're not having a problem uh, with the quality of the products going out because you're able to track what's happening. So yeah. you, technology has a big part to play there. Are we being supported well enough by government? I mean, we've all the business about Huawei that we, we've heard in the news recently. It looks like 5G is at best going to be delayed. Is that causing the UK to fall behind? I think that 5G is going to be absolutely essential for the rollout of certain types of technologies. If we look at the adoption of cloud software, for example, in manufacturing uh, environments, and 
this is a really interesting topic. The adoption of the adoption of manufacturing uh, or, or the adoption of cloud by manufacturers has generally been quite low, and that's because of latency issues. It's because of um, concerns of uh, putting my data somewhere in the cloud. We're now at a point where cloud infrastructure is incredibly secure. You have major vendors like AWS, and, and, uh, which is part of the Amazon group of companies. You have Azure, which is uh, managed and maintained by uh, Microsoft, which are incredible cloud platforms that allow companies to use things like distributed processing, et cetera. But delays in getting access to technologies like um, uh, fiber, uh, or 5G networks is certainly going to have an impact mm. on that because we just we don't want to introduce latency into the process of recording things that are going through maybe a high a high velocity manufacturing environment or a high velocity warehouse. Any latency that gets caused by um, connection issues or something like that could actually reflect as a dip in operational equipment efficiency. So I, I think. The government needs to do more. They need to invest significantly more in these types of technologies to help UK manufacturing to get a head start. Let's move on. I want to talk about the circular economy. Tell us a bit about it and how it differs from the, uh, the linear economy. So this is a really interesting topic. A lot of people think that the circular economy is just it's a way of, of just doing things in a very different way. It is, but it's also a philosophical discussion because... The circular economy is about doing things through different types of processes and approaches to ultimately ensure that what we're doing uh, has the minimum level of impact on the environment. Now that sounds simple when you talk about it that way, but the circular economy impacts multiple elements within an organization. If you look at things like product design, are we designing our products to be reusable or recyclable? So if you're manufacturing something like a plastic widget, can that widget be recycled if someone doesn't need to use it anymore? Or if you're building uh, large products or more complex products, are they componentized? Are they modularized so that you can replace one module with another so that you can extend the economic life cycle of the product? You look at things like your distribution network, supply chains. Are you sourcing locally, for example? That's a big part of the circular economy. It doesn't have to be that we're bringing everything close together. Are we nearshoring or are we, are we offshoring? Um, why are we making those decisions? So the circular economy impacts pretty much everything that an organization will do across the spectrum. Yeah. It's about making the types of decisions that will ultimately have the best possible impact on the organization as well as on the um, on the environment as a whole, yeah. so it, it's a complex area of of discussion. <laughs> Interesting stuff, Rob. Let's move on uh, to another topic. At MTD, we're really keen to talk about the importance of apprenticeships and, and training moving forward. Do you agree? Apprenticeships are absolutely essential. I, I think it's how the UK is going to. Uh, almost regenerate its manufacturing industry. Um, we've gone through a period where people have been talking about manufacturing in the UK through this lens of it's all doom and gloom, nothing, nothing really interesting is happening. And it's almost become a very unattractive career in the UK. Um, everybody wants to be a YouTuber or a, a, a social media expert. But there are a lot of um, there are a lot of UK companies that have successfully re-implemented apprenticeships that are starting to see the benefits of that. Um, I, I, what's really important for me is that we look at this through a different lens. Um, I think the idea of apprenticeships just being focused on uh, somebody that needs to manage the, the, the manufacturing line has changed. Um, we look at some of the, the, the new types of skills that manufacturers are going to have to be looking at, things like data sciences, um, things like uh, technology to manage CNC machines and things like that. Those are highly specialized careers. People are going to university for that, but why not bring them into the organization, put them through an apprenticeship program, teach them how to effectively use the CNC machines? because. One of the arts of something like CNC is that there are 
potentially thousands upon millions of ways of directing a specific cut or making it so that you get that optimization. Yes, there's software that can help do that, but there's nothing like the eye of a designer who's managing that and plotting out the right path. So I think there's an opportunity for manufacturers to invest there. I think the other thing that UK manufacturing could do, which could be really interesting, is we're, we, we talk about this idea of the gig economy and, and people kind of being very transient in, in terms of the way that they work. One of the reasons why they're transient and why the gig economy is thriving at the moment is because people are shopping for skill sets. Why not bring some of those skill sets in home and actually uh, or in house and start to start to leverage that? I think it would be really interesting uh, to take a look at some of the uh, apprenticeship programs that have been run uh, throughout the throughout the globe at some of uh, at companies like Luke, at Google, like Google, for example, where, yes, it's technology, but they bring in people of diverse backgrounds, diverse, diverse thoughts. Um, we why not set up an, if you're in a in an environment which requires a huge amount of precision and control and and focus why not looking and bringing in children or teenagers who are on the spectrum so children with asperger's or autism who generally have the ability to be incredibly detail focused why not leverage them in those manufacturing operations and build a program that focuses in on those children they have a unique skill set they're able to sit and focus and, and pay attention to detail, unlike most of us that are not necessarily on the spectrum in the same way. So there's tons of opportunities. And I think mm. this is where manufacturing could take a, kind of take a leap forward and start to do things themselves, rather than relying on government programs to be able to do that. Because let's be honest, I think it's gonna be difficult to get any program started at the moment with the uh, with the commitments that the government is making to just keeping people employed. Yeah, um, I, I was going to, uh, Rob, we're running out of time. I, I just want to finish with, with quite a big question, but need a reasonably brief answer. As we emerge from lockdown, as we look forward, how do you see manufacturing and business emerging and looking at the longer term? How do you see it going? I think manufacturing in the UK has learned a significant lesson from COVID. We need to be smarter about how we manage our supply chains. We need to look at where we're sourcing products. But we also need to scrub off this, this idea that manufacturing in the UK has stayed. It's a tired, dead industry. Look at the way that the UK companies have adjusted. They've modified. Take someone like McLaren, manufacturing engines one week to manufacturing PPE. That's anything but stayed and, and, and stale as an industry. There is tons of opportunities for UK manufacturers to innovate, whether that be small pockets of innovation, just automating processes, or it be adjacent innovation, taking something that works in finance and moving it into manufacturing, or it's truly, innova truly innovative ideas that they can, they've been able to see a gap in the market where they can potentially look at things. I think manufacturing in the UK will also need to look at new types of economic models rather than necessarily selling their products, they might want to rent or lease the products if it's industrial machinery or if it's more complex products. Mm. Creating an economy around servitization as well. UK manufacturers should be looking to not only sell their products, but potentially offer services around them, aftermarket capabilities. That again is gonna tie back into the whole idea of the circular economy. Brilliant. Rob, some really challenging and interesting thoughts. Thank you very much. Rob Sinfield, Vice President of Product at Sage. It's been a pleasure. That's it for this week. Factory Talk next week, talking to Joe Routledge from Lumo. Look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye.